Okay, we're back again with the Orga Retro Series. Uh, we're here with the Dublin and Mead jerseys this time. They're looking pretty well. Um, if you want to get these jerseys, go to orgaretro.com and you'll get 15% off if you put in the promo code or game. So it probably started out as one of the great and endured as one of the great rivalries for 100 plus years. But these days, it's actually the shine has been taken off it a little bit by Dublin's dominance. I think probably nothing summed it up much more than the fallout to Ashburn Credit Union's um, social media message last year when they put up we did it again with a load of blue hearts five in a row sam is coming home to dublin again a load of claps well done to our very own at dino dino rock and team enjoy the celebrations everyone at ashburn ireland and remember we like to support all in our community i think that kind of summed up more than anything that there's a bit of a lost identity in me that i spoke with bernard flynn about this kind of legendary player with me talking about the amount of people that now live in the commuter belt that is me and that there's a bit of an identity crisis so at the moment, 117 to 4 in the, in the Leinster final last year, it feels like the rivalry isn't where it was. But it doesn't take away from the fact that it is an unbelievably storied rivalry. Yeah, it doesn't take away from the fact that that's an idiotic tweet as well. I know there's a fair commuter belt coming into Dublin, but the fact that they have that much of an identity crisis, that they would think that they could support Dublin or get away with that. Imagine in the early 90s, late 80s, imagine if something like that happened. There, there would have been, the knives would have been out and they never would have been put away like the rivalry they had back then it's obviously dissipated a bit in recent years but like as, as rivalries go historically I don't know if they get much better than this you're talking tip cork in hurling Dublin Mead in football It'd be like someone down in Carrick and Shore, which is right, it's very close to Tipperary Watford I mean, it's in Tipperary Watford and uh, Kilkenny that credit union congratulating Kilkenny or Watford. I mean, it's just unheard of. I can't, I can't believe it happened. And um, I think one of the Mead players came out and criticised it, and rightly so. You do have to go back 10 years since Mead last beat Dublin in the championship. And at the time, it was the tail end of Dublin not being able to deliver the Spice Boy sort of um, the hype machine, all of that kind of kind of feel to them. Pat Gilroy had come in and they'd been battered the year before by Kerry in the All Ireland semi final, and then you thought, okay, Dublin are going to steady down now. Build, he's brought through a few more young players, discarded. You know, the likes of Jo has even moved on the year before, and they go and they lose five nine to thirteen points. I think they had like six of those thirteen points scored after sixteen minutes. Good enough shape. Then all of a sudden, the likes of Stephen Bray goes to town with two one think Joe Sheridan got a goal as well and I even thought at the time Stephen Cluxon was a bit at fault for a couple of the goals and like as we know he's, he's a brilliant goalie got on the best of all time but it's you could argue that this was the game that changed Gaelic football. Yeah everybody talks about the, the start of Learwigs under Gilroy and how big of a maybe a turn on point that was but I have to say, this was, this was a bigger turning point. Like, even at the time, I remember Gilroy um, used to have the dubs staying in a hotel the night before a game. This was one of the things that they were doing back then. And that all kind of went out the window, to the best of my knowledge, after this. And a lot of things changed. They were trying things out defensively. Uh, a lot of them didn't work at all. Uh, it has to be said as well, though, there were a couple of things. Like, Mead's first goal, that Stephen Bray got an unbelievable goal, so then about 55 yards. Barry Cattle was penalised for a double hop that was never a double hop. He soloed the ball in front of himself and it bounced and then he bounced again and blown up by the referee. There were a couple of other little bits and pieces as well. Uh, Mead got a goal, Conor was foot blocked. Um, it should have been a free and it ended up in the net the far end. As you said, Stephen Cluxon was probably, I yeah, definitely would have been disappointed with, uh, with one of Keane Farland's goals anyway. But this was a big turning point. And it's funny, um, it was a turning point within Dublin in general, but also within their season. It went on, obviously we're beating an All-Ireland semi-final by Cork that year and even like Bernard Brogan even though they were beaten and beaten well Bernard Brogan ended up footballer of the year that year he was absolutely shooting the lights out but this changed this changed Gilroy's approach he realised that they had to become mean and they were mean at the back thereafter as a result of this like if you look at you compare this with the 2011 All-Ireland Final against Kerry like Dublin were mean in those games it changed their mentality completely particularly defensively yeah because Gilroy is very much trying to find his team he ended up with Brian Cullen as his wing forward and captain in the, the following season but Cullen had been dropped for a time in 2010 and then came in centre back but if you look at the change in this rivalry from 2010 onwards after the 5 9 to 13 points so 20 um 
2010, yeah, we're talking about a Mead win. Then Dublin win by a goal the next year, so it's a score. Then they win by seven the next year. Then the heavy beatings come in, like 320 to 110, 21 points to 11, 117 to, to four points. But one thing is probably a bit of a forgotten one at this stage, but in 2012, it kind of was the birth, well, maybe the first day that a TV replay or sort of a video ref was used without there being a plan to do it. I think Owen O'Gara had a shot and it, it obviously went over and uh, Marty Duffy hadn't given the, the score. But then Morris Deegan, and I remember looking down at it, he looked up at the big screen, saw that the score was, it did go over and then the decision was reversed. So it was kind of like the birth of that. It's a small little footnote in history, but like the GA denied that that's the reason that the score was overturned but he 100% looked up at it Morris Deegan and I, I, I definitely vividly remember it but anyway that's these days the classics when you look back over the year like who do you think of when you think of the classic Dublin games I think of Charlie Redmond and his over the top routine taking the freeze you think of J.O. of course um, Tommy Dowd and his bull teak head and fat neck I think of Trevor Giles and the, and the sleeves done up Graham Garrity, players like this. Yeah, the, the, the ones that come to mind for me straight away are, it's just, I don't know, it's funny. When you're talking about iconic lines on the pitch, Bernard Flynn, Brian Stafford, Colm O'Rourke, that's, that's, what I, that's what I think of. It's just, a, it's a line in the pitch. It's almost like, you know, it's the equivalent of Tipperary's Hell's Kitchen at the other end of the pitch. It's three lads that are synonymously linked together. And I suppose when you're, like, it was just, it was an amazing rivalry back then. Um, like ninety one, I, I like you're talking about like footnotes and history and stuff like that. Like nearly the All Ireland winner in nineteen ninety one is almost like a footnote in history. It was all it was all about Mead and Dublin that year. Really. That's what the that's what the GA were that's what people in GA were talking about, and that's probably what they're still talking about when they think of nineteen ninety one. And then the the fact that that game came. Probably for the GA, that, that four-game series probably came at the right time because 1990, the World Cup had taken over Ireland. 1988, the Euros. So it was very much everyone was thinking about soccer. As a young lad, 8, 9, 10 years of age, soccer was what I was completely wrapped up into. So this was probably a big thing to get people thinking about GA again. Like before, Between the four clashes, there was almost a quarter of a million people in Croke Park watching them. And like the Leinster Council with like a million quid in, in ticket sales. Obviously the prices were very different back then. But like it was all over the talk shows, all over the phone ins. And it probably just like I think the last game, the fourth one, that ended up being the first ever live Saturday game on RT. So like it, it was a huge thing. It was front page news. The GA was front page news. Like we know about it now. It's you know, it's back page stuff. When's it when's the front page news? Maybe on All Ireland weekend or something like that but this was front page news the whole way through and like you're talking about like you know great storytellers and that within the GA listening to Sean Boylan you know regale about those times it's phenomenal it's just a, a little interesting yarn um, about their preparations before that saga so they did an awful lot of lot, a lot of training done and a lot of matches hard matches played in we'll say the previous you know five to six years and just he talks about unusual training methods, methods. Sean Boylan this is all directly quoted did we think we were too old no but we did think the legs were tired, and that's why we ended up doing all the training in water. This is in 1991. Sonny O'Sullivan and Jerry O'Reilly from Dunboyne, who had run in the Olympics as well, were in Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, and got these buoyancy aids for me for the team. 20 of seven of them cost £3,500. So these are basically like um, aqua belts now that you would see people using now when they're trying to get back to training, to be running underwater. We had to train in water because their joints were perfect and the ligaments were fine, but their muscles were tired. So training in water re-energised them. We started doing that training in November 1990. Jerry, Mac Jerry McEntee had been away and I always remember him coming home and I brought him out to train in one night. After we left Garmentstown, he said, how are you going to face the people of Mead next year when you're beaten in the first round of Leinster and people ask how training was going and you have to say that we were fucking swimming. But you had to have a certain belief in yourself and your players, always, and our players always had that belief in themselves. Suddenly they got re-energised up until three weeks before the first round against Dublin, all of our training was done in water, which is just, like, you talk about modern training methods and stuff, like, it's amazing to think that they were doing that type of thing back then. Yeah, it's mad altogether. Um, I did a podcast with Bernard Flynn, who, of course, was, you know, won a couple of all irons with me there at the end of the 80s. <clears throat> so, and he told me a great story once, and I'm after finding it online here. It was from the 19... 
88 championship and Mead beat Dublin 2-5 to 9 points in the Leinster final and of course Mead went on then to play and win the final against Cork but the story goes that um, I th- he worked with uh, Dave Sinnott at the time they both worked together and they were going to end up being marking each other but anyway the story goes like this I remember it well as if it was only yesterday it was one of those moments that stays with you uh, Dublin's Davy Sinnott and I worked together for tenants the week before the Leinster final, Davey and I were in the papers every day because we were going to be marking each other. The hype was incredible. Tenants milked it for all it was worth and had arranged a reception for 50, 60 publicans after the match. On the, on the match day, my wife Madeline was in the stand with Davey's wife Marie. Davey was a clean player and had burst onto the scene the previous few years and was a breath of fresh air. I got the first few balls and then he hit me. Then I got a score and he did it again. I said, Davey, cop your effing self on. He hit me twice and if you do it again I'll bust you. The ball came out towards the middle of the field and I caught him with my elbow as far as I could and burst his nose. The referee didn't see my elbow but uh, did see Davy turning around and giving me a box. The game stopped, the crowd were going crazy, Davy was sent off. As he walked off he started to pump blood and the referee couldn't understand why. I remember him pleading with the referee that I hit him first. I was lying on the ground and thinking of my job, the first decent job I had in my life. My new Opal Ascona that made me feel like I was Don Johnson. I thought of my boss who was watching me playing and I was worried that I would lose my job in my car. I thought of the publicans who were going to be at our reception. I thought of Marie and Madeline together in the stands. Uh, all of these thoughts went through my head in seconds. There was a huge euphoria after we beat Dublin in the Leinster final. But then I met Madeline and Marie was with her and she was inconsolable. She had a bit of a go at me. Then Davy didn't show up at the gig. Although it was one of Sean Boylan's big things that the team went together after the match. But I got word back to him that I had to find Davy. I went to the gig. Hours went by and still no Davy and Marie. And Marie was worried. My boss decided to have a party in his house and swords and Davy arrived. <laughs> after an hour of drinking and trashing it out we made up. It was, uh, I crashed my lovely car late that night. I had to do a promotion in Gibneys in Malahide the next day. I was in a state. Who was the guy who put his arm around me and got me through it? Davy Sinnott. What did he do? The next day was a bank holiday Monday. Great man that he was. Davy drove me to, to the promotion and got all the stuff I needed and helped me with my promotion in the pub. That's what the GA is all about. I'll never forget him for that. So that's quite the story. Long-winded, but quite the story. That's like that. That just sums up that 1991 saga. Like that's a soap opera within itself. That's a documentary almost within itself. It's that's just yeah, it's different gravy. The fact that they were working together and uh, marking each other, playing against each other, you don't get much better than that. Um, and if you jump forward to 1995, like this would have been a great performance by Jo. I think Paul Clark with a fisted goal. He might have scored something like one two. Dublin battered. Meeting that all or that Leinster final and went on, of course, to win the All Ireland against Tyrone. But it was one eighteen to to one eight. You know, a proper beating. Like losing by ten points in football back then was a serious scutcheon. The fact that Mead went on to win an All Ireland the following season in ninety six is amazing. And then considering, just shows the yo yo nineteen ninety seven then beaten in the first round by Offaly. Yeah, Offaly beat them. Yeah, I never forget that. Like because around those times the hurlers and footballers in Offaly were absolutely flying. Um, I think Offaly dethroned both All Ireland champions uh, in either ninety seven or ninety eight. Um, yeah, it was unreal. Like it was such a such a turnaround. But Boylan Boylan had kind of had that ability to resurrect to resurrect Mead. You know, there was a couple of times when he thought maybe they, they were finished. And no more than those kind of unusual training methods. He even did something just jumping back to uh, to ninety one for a second. Um, I asked him about what the, I asked him one time in an interview. Um, about going to Scotland. They went to Scotland before the fourth game in 91. And I said, where did the idea come from? And he said, after the, the first match, the county board said to me, do you want to take the players away, away anywhere? And I said, we were fine. I was asked again after the second match, but said no again. After the third match, uh, I went around to all the wives and girlfriends of the players and said, listen, if you want to do something with the lads, uh, if, if I want to do something with the lads, would you mind? They were like, Sean, whatever it takes to beat the dubs. Anyway, I got in my head, we go to Scotland. Myself and our sponsor, uh, Noel Keating from Keypack, God rest him, went across. David Beggy was working over in Scotland all the time and picked us up in a souped up escort. And Noel, who was used to a big mark, had his knees up on the windscreen. Uh, Jinxie was flying down, Jinxie as Beggy was known, was flying down the roads and smoking. Jesus, would you stop? Anyhow, we head up towards Loch Lomond and came to a little village called Dry Men and stopped to get a cup of tea in a place called uh, Buchanan Arms. After five minutes, I said, This is the place. Ironically, he said it was where Billy Connolly was from. So they went and trained there between the third and fourth match in 91. And that was just, 
like and even talking about the other the, the training methods that's what Boylan did to re-energise him so they go from 95 when they nearly look like they're out in their last legs almost to come along in 96 and the likes of uh, Martin O'Connell, O'Connell the, the Millennium Man of course the Iron Man driving them forward in 96 and you have the, the likes of Graham Garrity probably was coming into his real pomp at that stage as well um yeah, it was phenomenal the way they were able to turn that around. Yeah, it's such a shame that this rivalry isn't strong at the moment. And you'd hope in the coming years that it, they can turn it around. Because Mead obviously have the population base, so if they can make the most of that, it'll probably take a long time now, even just... When you're under this home as hard as they have been in recent years, it's very hard even psychologically to get yourself out of it. Even if you have the raw materials, it can be hard to make that breakthrough. So hopefully just for the sake of a great rivalry, they can do that. And uh, people can let us know if they think that that is going to happen. Um... The other thing is, if you had a choice between Dermot Connolly and Graham Garrity, who would you take? Oh Lord, uh, that that they are two players, two unbelievable players to to pit against themselves. We're just trailing back through the archives. Well, obviously, Graham Garrity ended up having a trial with Arsenal. Um, he had scored he had scored one two um in the Leinster final in ninety four from right half back, and I guess that Crow Park that day was none other than Alex Ferguson. And uh, he spoke to Jerk Canning after and said that he was impressed with Garrity and he was impressed with Tommy Dowd for his aggression and Jack Sheedy. And then, as a result of that, Gerrity ended up getting a trial with Arsenal. And uh, this is kind of how the story played out. Gerrity, looking back at this um, a couple of years ago, he said, um, we played the Leinster final. I stayed in the hotel that night with the team, and I got a phone call from my dad. I did, don't know how he actually found out I was there. He says, there's a fella from Arsenal coming to see you at 12 o'clock tomorrow, so you better be home. I thought he was messing but here, here's how it comes about. Dublin had beaten us in the Leinster final. I scored 1-2. Alex Ferguson was at the game. The interview hit him after the game and asked him if anyone impressed him. He said, the blondie fella playing number five. Uh, I like the way he gets up and down the pitch. He had an eye for goal. And obviously, other people would have heard this. And he subsequently went to Arsenal. And Paul Merson said that he was the fittest player he had ever seen. And like, there was so much about him. He had... He had that look, that kind of blonde look, that iconic look. He had all the skills, he had all the athleticism, and like he had a fair bit of rogue to him as well. Like the, the thing, I suppose, the comparisons between him and Connolly are on the pitch, absolute icons, could do anything, could light up occasions, and maybe colourful off the pitch as well. And that's kind of what endears even those characters to the public a bit more. But Graham Garrity had, had an unbelievable career. To be able to do it in the, at, in, at the back, and then to go to be basically your target man, your main forward, a full forward, a phenomenal player. And like for, for Garrity to do it over such a long period of time and to do it in all the different positions, like whether he was wing back, whether he was wing forward, even full forward. Remember when he came back under Banty, it was around 2011 or 12, he was about 37 years of age. He scored a goal against Kildare into the hill at Croke Park and it was disallowed wrongly. You know, that would have been some comeback. He, and didn't he play with Blanchardstown IT into his 40s? So he's this sort of, like, he's such a brilliant player. And like that brilliant goal he scored against Tyrone one year where the ball came in over the top and he just palmed it up one-handed, or well, two-handed maybe, up over the goalkeeper's head. Whereas Connolly, I mean, you, you talk about Arsenal uh, bringing in um, Garrity. God knows how many different sports Connolly would have excelled at. Can you imagine him at either AFL, rugby, I say it doesn't matter. He probably would have been brilliant at everything. He was a great hurler, actually. He played. Um, I've seen him play for Vincent's over the years, of course, but he would have played minor for Dublin and certainly would have been good enough to, to be in with the seniors. Yeah, two fair icons who were able to produce iconic moments and uh, just brilliant to watch. So <laughs> very, very hard to pick between the two. Just an interesting kind of a sub note to Connolly as well, like, and, and this is just yet again another subplot or sub story between the Dublin rivalry. So Connolly actually ended up uh, dropping himself off the either dropping himself or being dropped off the Dublin panel after that hiding in 2010, and nobody really knew about it at the time. So he only spoke about it on the the Blues the Color podcast a couple of years ago, and um, so he just said it was a funny one for me because in 2010, me and Mr. Gilroy had a bit of a falling out. It might not have been docu in the me documented in the media or anything like that. I stepped away after the Leinster final, which in hindsight was probably the wrong thing to do. We played so badly against Mead with the five goals, the changing of our defence, and probably the making of our defence. Then the lads had a great run to the qualifiers and should have beaten Cork. We're lucky not to beat Cork, in my opinion. Cork got a handy All-Ireland beaten down in that final last year. And that changed the course of his career as well. I think he kind of realised maybe the 
the errors of his way. He was back in 11, back playing brilliant stuff, and obviously picked up you know, a number of All Ireland since. But it's it's a tough one pitting the two of them together. Like they're two icons within both counties. And um, be interested to hear what other, what other people think. And if, if we put that out to a vote, how, how that would go? Which one them you'd have in your dream team? Yeah, I think it's unfair to ask me to vote on this one or to to make a decision. I refuse to do it because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just enjoy watching both of them play. Um, anything else that we haven't covered in this rivalry? No, no, just there's so many like there's so many games probably. That we that we haven't talked about, but I suppose the, the main ones like eighty eight, ninety one, two thousand and ten, ninety five, even as well. Like there's so many, there's so many great stories in in that rivalry, and I suppose it's always great neighbors like that when there's a tetchiness and um, you know a little bit of an undercurrent to it. It's hard beat that in the GA. There's nothing like neighbor neighboring rivalries, and I think everybody in the GA is longing. For me to get back, maybe for Dublin to drop a small bit, and for me to get back, and hopefully in the next maybe 10, 15 years, we'll see a resurgence to that rivalry again because there's nothing like it. As GA rivalries goes, to say, I don't think there's a better football rivalry than Mead and Dublin. Yeah, absolutely. It's up there with the very best. And uh, if you want to get these jerseys, go to orgaretro.com and put in the promo code OURGAME and you get 15% off. 